Hello YouTube, this is Douglas. After three attempts, I've finally managed to implement ambient occlusion in my voxel game engine. The voxel game engine is a hobby project of mine. I'm attempting to build a game world in which users can create, destroy, and interact. Part of creating this infinite interactable world involves creating aesthetically pleasing scenes, and part of creating aesthetically pleasing scenes is the lighting. Today I'll be discussing one kind of lighting, ambient occlusion, how most games implement it, but how those approaches didn't work for me, and I'll be showing off the brand new and, as far as I know, original approach that I've taken to creating ambient occlusion in my voxel engine. So let's get started. Ambient occlusion, or AO for short, refers to a specific kind of lighting effect. If you look up into the corner of your room, where the wall meets the ceiling, you'll notice that the little corner crevice there is a bit darker and in shadow in comparison to just the walls and ceilings themselves. That is ambient occlusion. The reason that ambient occlusion happens is because light bouncing around your room is less likely to bounce into cracks and crevices rather than just bouncing off a flat surface. It's kind of like how with a TV screensaver, the little TV logo is less likely to bounce into the corner and only does so very rarely. And ambient occlusion is a very important but subtle effect, like I wouldn't have even thought about it consciously before becoming a graphics developer. But ambient occlusion helps to highlight details in a scene and make the scene look more realistic. Ambient occlusion also helps users identify what uh, objects are in a scene and how they are relative to one another. For example, if you look at this test scene here, it's kind of difficult to tell whether the ball is sitting on the floor or floating in the air, right? But add some ambient occlusion, and bam, it's clear that the ball is sitting on the ground. So this is a very important effect. Without it, scenes kind of look flat. I first started implementing this back in March because a number of people in my comment section had been asking for it. Now there are a couple of approaches that games commonly take uh, for ambient occlusion. Minecraft takes a per block approach. Minecraft just takes a block and looks at the blocks directly adjacent to it. So whenever Minecraft sees two blocks configured like this, it knows to paint a shadow in the crevice between those blocks. When I was first figuring out how to do this, I ruled this approach out right away. My voxels are so small, any sort of per voxel AO wouldn't go far enough. I need shadows that are on the order of 4 or even 8 voxels. That left the other common approach that you'll find often in industry, which is screen space ambient occlusion. And the way screen space ambient occlusion works is it's kind of like a, a camera filter. You generate your entire scene normally, you get an image of your scene, and you get an image of your scene's depth, describing how far away everything is from the camera. And from this you do a post-processing pass, basically, where you generate the ambient occlusion data using some stochastic random sampling. A lot of big AAA games do this, in fact I've implemented this same algorithm professionally, but when I went to try and implement an SSAO algorithm in my voxel game, it didn't turn out quite as well as I would have hoped. You can see on screen are sort of the results here. The first challenge that I bumped into was the fact that SSAO generates smooth shadows that are on a per pixel basis, and that's exactly what you want for a normal polygon based game. But in my game, all of the lighting is done per voxel. Each voxel is one solid color. And so this ended up looking really weird. It, I just didn't like the way that the ambient occlusion faded smoothly from one voxel to the next. To fix this, I tried to round the positions at which ambient occlusion was calculated to each individual voxel. But um, this came with its own host of problems, namely, because ambient occlusion is a stochastic technique, it is um, kind of grainy and has some random noise, which isn't really noticeable when it's on a per pixel level, but when you're rounding your position and taking one single sample for every voxel, 
the ambient occlusion output becomes really noisy, and so I struggled with these sorts of flickering textures and just couldn't get it to work all the way back in March. I recently came back to the same problem last week, now in December, and I had the idea to try and take an average of the shadowing values for every single pixel on the voxel in the scene. I hoped that this would eliminate the noisy artifacts that I was seeing, but a long story short, it just didn't. Um, even with the averaging, there was still noise. So at this point, I was kind of at a loss, and I stepped back, went to the drawing board, and came up with a completely different technique um, that better leverages the volumetric nature of my voxel data. But before we talk about that, I'd like to touch upon the sponsor of today's video, CodeCrafters. CodeCrafters is an educational website built for experienced developers by experienced developers. Unlike other coding websites, which just have short challenges, CodeCrafters guides you through long-form projects, which enhance both your ability to code and your domain knowledge about critical enterprise software like Docker, Git, or SQLite. I can tell you firsthand that CodeCrafters is a great way to learn new coding skills and test your programming metal against tough challenges. If you want to become a better developer, then use the link in the description to get started for free today. Thanks again to CodeCrafters for sponsoring this video. The standard techniques for ambient occlusion had been insufficient for my project. To overcome this, I created a new model for ambient occlusion. The idea is simple. In a perfect world, if I had unlimited time and memory to compute the shadows that every object in the scene should receive, what I would do is this. I would draw a tiny little sphere around each voxel in the scene. I would make the sphere about 8 voxels in radius, because that is how far I want my ambient occlusion shadows to extend. And then I would tally up the total number of voxels in this sphere. I would figure out what percentage of the sphere is full of volume. And that percentage is a rough estimate of how shadowed the point at the sphere's center should be. And the reason this works is because if you think about, say, a flat surface, if you draw a sphere at a point on that surface, exactly 50% is going to be in the ground, full of volume, and 50% is going to be in air. So exactly 50% of the sphere will be full, and the point at the center should not be in shadow from ambient occlusion. But if we instead consider a point at the intersection between the floor and a wall, for instance, this sphere is going to be 75% full, because it will contain both the volume from the wall and from the floor. And since 75 is greater than 50%, this point in the corner here should have some amount of ambient occlusion shadowing applied to it. And this model is not perfect, nor is it physically accurate, but it's a good way to estimate the effect that I want to achieve. However, um, this is an impractical approach because it requires counting up the volume surrounding every single voxel. While this is possible, it's pretty much like computing a distance field, um, so there are ways to pre-compute it and then sample it efficiently, but I needed both the computation time for ambient occlusion to be fast, and I also needed the um, runtime sampling time for ambient occlusion to be fast. So what I did was I approximated my approximation. Here's how the ambient occlusion system you see on screen ultimately works. I divide my volume up into these 16 by 16 by 16 cubes, and these cubes roughly represent the same thing as the sphere that we were using in our theoretical calculations earlier. I tally up the total number of voxels, which is in each cube, and so you'll notice that exactly at the center of the cube, the value, the total number of voxels within each cube, represents the percentage of the volume that is full at the center of that cube. And so this gives us a rough estimate for a subset of the data. Well, how do we figure out um, the amount of volume that is full between these two cubes? And the answer is very simple. We just use linear interpolation. So just like when you blow up an image, it becomes blurry because the computer is basically filtering and filling in the pixels between two color values. In the same way, we blend smoothly from one adjacent volume box 
to another in order to get the fullness amounts for each voxel between these two boxes. And with that fullness value, we just use it to estimate ambient occlusion like earlier. Uh, the way this is done is I just look at the percent fullness, and if it's greater than 50, the remaining 50% determines how much darkness is applied to the voxel. And so this was my model, and that's how the algorithm works. I went ahead and implemented this in a test case, and the results were even better than I could have possibly imagined. It turns out that when you do this, the sampling and the linear interpolation never um, overestimates, um, which means you never get erroneous shadows where they shouldn't be. Overall, the effect is very convincing and it looks great. Here's a test scene of me underground digging around. You can see that it's really quite hard to tell where the wall ends and the ceiling begins and whatnot, but as soon as we implement AO, it's easy to discern where the walls and the ceiling are. And what's more, it looks good. It looks realistic. In addition to working quite nicely, this ambient occlusion system is also much more performant than any screen space ambient occlusion system ever could be. With SSAO, you need an entire extra render pass, and typically you have eight or more random access texture reads as well in order to do the sampling for that like image filter. This ambient occlusion technique is much simpler. All I have to do is tally up the voxels in each 16x16x16 16 by 16 by 16 box. That's very quick to do on the CPU, since I'm already iterating over my voxel volume in order to do greedy meshing. And then on the GPU, this is implemented as a single hardware filtered texture read. So to do that linear interpolation, um, I don't even actually have to write any code because the GPU is already programmed to blur images like this for me. Um, so it's cheap as dirt as well, which is really quite nice. That's the gist of the ambient occlusion system. Before the video ends, I just want to take a brief moment to touch upon the larger future of my engine. Since the past two videos have been very hyper fixated on one implementation detail or another, um, the engine is currently undergoing a graphics overhaul, which is really quite exciting. I'm switching from OpenGL, which is trash, to WebGPU, a brand new and shiny graphics API for both web and native. And this has already had a number of benefits. With WebGPU, I was able to create the compute shaders that you saw in my terrain generation video. And I've also been able to implement the technique known as vertex pulling which has allowed me to improve my greedy meshing algorithm and actually reduce triangle counts in my scenes by 15 to 20 percent, which is another big improvement. That's about it for this video. If you enjoyed and hopefully learned something, then please leave a like and a comment down below and don't forget to subscribe. I would love to get to 6,000 subs by uh, the end of the year. Thank you very much for watching and happy holidays.